All right. Well, it's good to see all of you here today. Let's all stand together as we begin singing um, some old songs. We've got some songs today about the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me White as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountains it flows to the lowest valleys the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power and it soothes my doubts and calms my fear. And it dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never its power it reaches 
to the highest mountains. It flows to the lowest valleys. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Sing that chorus once again. It reaches, it reaches to the highest mountains. It flows to the lowest valleys. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose. Sing it again. It will never lose. It will never lose its power. Father, thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But God, thank you that in your infinite wisdom, Jesus, in your infinite submission, you became the sacrifice for sinners. Thank you, Father, that you made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in you. Lord, help us to honor you today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, listen, good to see you today. Thankful to God that you are here. I'm excited to be here with you. I know that we have a lot to be thankful for. And obviously, we have a lot to pray about. So I just wanted to go ahead and mention very quickly, do not have any um, arrangements at this point on uh, Benji Tatum uh, nor on Pumpkin. So don't have any arrangements at this point. I know that those will be made here over the next day or two. And so as soon as we have those, we will be certain uh, to get those out to you. So as we think about, obviously, we've got to, we need to be praying for them. But how? let's start off like we normally do. What are you thankful for? This week, how has God blessed you? How has He um, shown Himself faithful to you? What has God just? Has He been faithful to you this week? Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. All right, somebody. I'm thankful that my friend is doing well. I'm her new um, oral. Treatment for her cancer. She's not mm-hmm. going to chemo and the radiation a second time around. And she's having such a better time with it. And praise God, he answered prayer. Amen. All right, something else you're thankful for today? I'm just thankful for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you're thankful for um, before we turn to prayer meetings? I'm thankful that we can still meet with all what's going on around us. Yeah. Um, because you always feel like when it's the next time that we're going to have to go back into the not being able to fellowship, but yeah. I'm with God's glory and, mm-hmm. and thank Him in advance. Amen. For us, a terrible time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're right. 
thankful. Today is Chloe, our youngest daughter's birthday. She is 10 today. And so I look back and I'm like, how in the world has she gotten to be double digits already? Um, I don't know if you would testify to this. I, I used to think as a kid, you know, you, you'd have Christmas and then you'd think, oh, it's going to be a whole nother year. And it seemed like time would just drag by. And the older that I get, it's like, good night. Is Christmas already here already? It seems like yesterday we were cleaning up the wrapping paper. And so um, I don't know if that's your, been your experience, but it seems like time just... The older I get, the more quickly it seems like time passes. I know it's still the same 24 hours and all that, but just, I guess, my perception um, is... They you know, were getting back quicker each year. <laughs> you know, that's true. It used to be you didn't have any of that mindset until after Thanksgiving. That's right. And now what you see is this Halloween barely gets here, and they're, they're ready to show that off the yep. door. <laughs> that's right. You know, Brother Ron, you, you, you just had... Yes, sir. And Ms. Rachel was the one of the wives. Yeah. And Chloe, before you turn around, it'd be her time. That's right. I mean, just the new birthdays come real fast. Real fast. Real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I'm thankful. Um, and then Mikey's birthday is tomorrow. Um, and so, we have, we got to shift gears quickly. You know what I mean? <laughs> even of this most recent hurricane Ida, from far southwest Louisiana, the swap all the way up into New York, the state of New York. I mean, it's just devastation. Um, and I don't know if you have ever been in a community that was hit with major devastation. Where I served previously, um, we, the April 27th tornado outbreak, that historic outbreak, it particularly affected Alabama, um, uh, an F5 was, you know, 15 minutes north of our church. And so we saw firsthand the devastation. And, I mean, it was, you could go there even today and still see the scars of that, of that tornado. When, when you see um, devastation like that up close and personal, it's a, it's a, a scary, a scary thing. Even now when I hear, you know, sometimes the weather forecasters will say, well, we have the potential for violent, long-track tornadoes. I never really understood that. But now when I hear that, um, I, I, I mean, literally, there's cold chills just because when you stand in the yard with a man who lost his wife as he tried to hold on to her and she was ripped from his arms and you, you go through the community and you see Everywhere you look, devastation and death. Um, horrible. Um, so thank God at this point we've been spared that. Um, but it's the praise and prayer request. We pray for those who are suffering even now. Um, thank God that we are. And the, and the earthquake in Mexico. I mean, there's just um, a lot going on all around the world. You know, and I go back to, you know, when you look at the curse of sin, of sin the Bible says the creation itself groans under the curse of sin. So you see these storms, this devastation, 
um, how even creation itself is groaning under this curse. And, um, you know, you think about the devastation of tornadoes and earthquakes and things, and you say, well, how could that be good? God causes all things to work together for good. That doesn't mean that necessarily that particular thing is good, but God in his sovereignty can take even the, the bad things in our life and work them together for our good, for those who love him and all the according to his purpose. And so um, that's Romans 8, 28. And so, but yeah, it's tough when you're, when you're face to face with devastation to see, God, how, how is this going to be worked together and all for good? Um, and breaks your heart for those who are suffering. That's right. Yeah. It's like, Lord, what have we done? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Scary. Any other praise before we go to praise? All right, as you draw our attention to praise, obviously pray for the Tatum family, pray for the Moore family. Um, uh, Jimmy McCall is having a Malaysian, so pray for him. Um, pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Um, other prayer needs today. Pray for uh, Jerry and Juanel. Somebody else, other prayers today. Obviously, you can you remember uh, Mr. Eddie Bishop and Miss Kathy? Um, you can pray for them. Pray for Christy and Dean. Someone else, other prayers. Miss Alinda uh, will be having surgery. Uh, the plan is next week, uh, next Tuesday at this point. And so pray that that would um, transpire. I know she had a difficult time with recovery last time. So pray for her, please. Um, but I hear that unspoken request. You don't really want to talk about it, but God knows that there's a need on your heart. What about lost or backslidden friends, family members, coworkers, just folks that you're, you're, you're concerned about? Obviously, we always want to pray for our country, um, our leaders. Pray for those who are um, still stranded in Afghanistan. Um, saw news last night. Um, uh, estimates of folk, the numbers of folks. It's amazing how um, and sad that as you begin to get more and more estimates of folks that are still there that are Americans, the number seems to, at least what I've been hearing and reading, continuing to rise the amount of our folks who are still trapped. Um, and so pray for them as well as our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who are under persecution right now. All right, anybody else before we pray? All right, if not, let's pray together. Father, you are good to us. It's a beautiful day that you've given to us, Lord. It's the day that you have made. Um, Lord, help us to rejoice and be glad in it. God, thank you for providing for us, um, Lord, not just food and God, thank you for providing shelter and family and friends and church building to meet in and um, a time of fellowship that we look forward to here just a bit. Um, and God, we just thank you for that. Thank you for um, protecting us as we, we think about the disaster uh, disasters that are happening really all, seemingly all around us from hurricanes to earthquakes to other issues, God, thank you for protecting us. But Lord, we do pray for those who have been affected. Um, God, that you would be merciful. And thank you that uh, in the darkest of circumstances, Lord, you can work and move and convict and draw and comfort. And you can mobil you mobilize your people to, to be a blessing. Thank you for those um, Southern Baptist disaster relief workers who are working now um, to try to help meet needs of folks who have lost so much. And God, we thank you for that. Thank you for Miss Diane's friend who's doing well with the treatments. God, what a what a blessing that is from you. And so we say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to meet here together um, in spite of uh, the pandemic that 
is, is raging around us. And um, Thank you for how you've blessed us and how um, you have just been so good. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for the health that you've given to each of us that's allowed us to be here today. Um, and Lord, we know there's a lot of folks who would love to be here, but whose health is preventing them. And so God, we just pray that you would comfort them and, and heal them and touch them and raise them up. Lord, I thank you for Chloe. What a blessing she is to us. And so, Lord, thank you for letting me be her daddy. Um, thank you for her helper to seek after you and to uh, love you with all of her heart and uh, to be the young lady that you would desire her to be. God, for Mikey, thank you for him. Thank you for letting me be his daddy. And I pray that you'll help me to be uh, the kind of man that he would look to and say, that's what a godly man is like. I want to be like my daddy because um, daddy's like Jesus. And so, Lord, pray, God, help me to do that. Lord, as we think about prayer needs, Lord, our hearts are heavy for uh, Miss Kathy and Robin and the Tatum family and their friends and the loss of Benjamin. God, I just pray um, that you would comfort them. Lord, thank you um, that he, he knew you uh, and he knows you. He is in your presence. And so, Lord, for that, we praise your name. Um, but, Lord, there are broken hearts this morning. And so, God, I just ask you um, to bind up their broken hearts, to give them peace that passes all understanding. God, for Punkin's family and friends. and um, God, I just pray that you would comfort them um, and that you would just wrap your arms around them and give them a peace that passes all understanding. Uh, for Mr. Jimmy, God, I pray that you'd touch him. Thank you for he and Mr. Dorinda. Um, God, I pray that the procedure has gone well this morning um, and that, Lord, you would just um, use this to help him and that as he faces other test and things, God, that you would just um, touch him in a powerful way. Lord, for our, our citizens and our brothers and sisters um, who are, are in Afghanistan right now, God, I pray for them that you would give grace for our citizens and our allies, God, that you'd allow them to get out. And uh, For our brothers and sisters, um, Lord, I cannot imagine the persecution that they're enduring right now. And so, God, I pray that you would that you would bless them, that you would give them grace, uh, that you would protect them, and that, Lord, you would show yourself faithful. But, Lord, for uh, Mr. Jerry and Ms. Wanell, God, I, t I pray that you'd just touch them, bless them. As, as he tries to minister and help her, God, I pray that you would um, just give him grace and strength and wisdom and that you touch her body and, um, Lord, just do a special work there. God, for Mr. Ke Mr. Eddie and Miss Miss Kathy, Lord, I thank you uh, for good results uh, with some tests. But God, I just pray you continue to touch him, allow the, the treatments to be effective, and I pray that our brother would be cancer free. Um, thank you for them and their love for you and for your church. For Christy and Dean, I pray you be with her as she faces upcoming surgeries. Show yourself faithful there. For Jason Rigdon, God, I pray that you would touch him. For Miss Linda, Mr. James, as she's facing surgery next week, I pray that you would allow it to go well. Um, allow the recovery to be much smoother than they anticipate and that she would regain um, her strength and that this would indeed solve the pain. And, and Lord, that you'd just bless them. Father, there's a lot of needs around us um, and some of them that are that are difficult, Lord, that we don't really want to talk about. But, Father, you know every one of them. And you are able to meet every need. And so, God, I pray that you do that. For those who are lost, that we have opportunity to speak into their life. God, give us boldness. Thank you that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. God, help us to share the word. Um, that they might hear the gospel and repent and believe. God, for those who have wandered away, God, help us to not be content with that. Help us to reach out to them and to minister to them and to draw them back. God, for our country... Lord, I pray for our president, um, our vice president, our military commanders, our senators and representatives, Lord, for our governor, um, our local state officials, our mayor, our city council, our first responders, our hospital workers. And Lord, there has been a tremendous amount of stress and pressure on them over the last 18 months battling the pandemic, and I pray that you'd give wisdom and grace and mercy and pray for our president, Lord, you'd save him and our vice president as well. And 
God, I just pray that you would be merciful to us even though we don't deserve it. Be gracious to us even though we don't deserve it. Um, Help us to do what you want us to do and to be what you want us to be. Lord, today I pray as we dive into your word that you would speak to us and help us to remember things that it is easy to forget. I love you, Jesus, and I praise you in your name. Amen, amen. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, and I sure hope that you do, invite you to grab it, please, and open to the book of 1 Corinthians. Obviously, again, continuing to walk right through 1 Corinthians, um, verse by verse, line by line. Scripture describes it this way, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, walking through this great book. And again, not to overly belabor the point, but we, we kind of walk through this book Understanding that Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, the church that was plagued with division and difficulty and immorality. And there were some things that they had asked Paul. There were some things that had been observed about them. And so Paul is running really two tracks. He's addressing issues that he's aware of and he's answering questions. And so he comes to this section. Last week we talked about the issue of head coverings, which hats in the church. That's kind of an interesting thing to address, but we understand uh, from the text last week, how the, they had kind of gotten that out of order. And so they were trying to understand how is it that we operate in the way that God has called us to. And it, it was much deeper than a fashion accessory. And then we come to a, a section that is familiar, uh, that we've often heard. Um, but the church at Corinth faced these issues and there were some things going on. And we'll address them as we walk through the text. Now notice with me please, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. If you found your place there, stand with me please to honor the reading of God's word. 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to begin reading there in verse 17. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church... I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you eat together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore... Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren... When you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home so that you'll not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Speak, Lord, and may we obey in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, a lengthy passage that begins to deal with the issue of the Lord's Supper. Now, when we think about the Lord's Supper, uh, it is what is known as an ordinance, right? An ordinance in the church. Now, how many of you remember the two ordinances that Jesus has ordained for his church? The two Things that he has called us to observe as a church, the two ordinances, that is baptism and the Lord's Supper. I mean, we've seen both of those, right? We've seen people baptized and we have observed the Lord's Supper together. Now, we know Jesus commanded us to do that, uh, that we are to baptize them, remember, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Matthew 28. Now, when Paul founded the church at Corinth, he, he set these up. That's what they were supposed to be doing. And when we think about the Lord's Supper, it is tied to 
The Passover meal. Now, those of us who are familiar with our biblical history understand the Passover meal. That was the meal that was celebrated in Exodus. You remember, um, God had delivered his people. He was about to deliver them from Egyptian bondage. Um, I can go back, but I don't think I need to because of your knowledge of the Scripture. You understand that the Israelites had gone into Egypt um, as the guests of Joseph. They began to grow there. The Bible records that there was a Pharaoh who arose who did not know Joseph or what he had done for Egypt, and they began to be persecuted. And they were there under persecution. They began to cry out, God raises up Moses. Moses comes, the, ten, the, the, the plagues come, and you remember the final plague, the death angel. And so we see this meal, this Passover meal. It was going to celebrate that God's passing over them in judgment. He reminded them that this day is going to be a memorial to you. You're to celebrate it as a continual feast. He told them that in Exodus 12. That's interesting. This is the meal that Jesus is observing with his disciples that Paul refers to here in our text. Jesus, listen, Jesus observed the Passover meal. He, he did. He fulfilled all righteousness. He did this. And he changes the Passover meal from remembering their deliverance from Egypt to our remembering his deliverance of us from the bonds of sin. As the Israelites were in bondage to Egypt, we were in bondage to sin. And Jesus reminds us of the freedom that is ours in him. Now we think about the early church. What were they committed to? You remember Acts 2.42. They were uh, the apostles teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and the prayer. And so they were breaking bread. They were, ce- they were celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Now notice what Paul says, in giving you instructions, I don't praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worse. He says, listen, I'm, 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 I'm bewildered that you could find yourself in this place. How is it that you've come to this point? He says, I'm giving you instructions. Literally the word there means I'm commanding you. I'm, I'm, I'm imploring you and warning you because you're coming together not for the better but for the worse. And then he begins to tell them what they had forgotten. Now, I want us to see three things that the church had forgotten. Uh, and it's a danger for us, too. Okay? It, it, these are things that we could forget, and I'm urging you this morning, we got to remember them. Okay, First, the church had forgotten the importance of unity. Look at verse 18. He says, When you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, And in part, I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you come to meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, one takes his own supper first, another one is hungry, another is drunk. And then he says, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? I will not praise you. Now notice, this group is coming together. This church is coming together. Now the word for church, you probably know this, is the word ekklesia, which literally come, means the called out ones. These are ones who have been called out by God to salvation. They've been called out from their sin. They are a group. They're a congregation of people, believers together. He says, when the church meets together, I hear that divisions exist among you. And the sad thing is, is that he says, and in part I believe it. Why? Because he'd already dealt with this at the beginning of the book. You remember, he says, one says, I'm of Paulus. One says, I'm of Paul. One says, I'm of Cephas. And the other says, I'm of Christ. The church at Corinth was chronically divided and conflicted. He says, there's divisions among you. You're going opposite directions. That word literally means to tear. He says, you're being torn apart, not from the outside, but rather from the inside. There were quarrels and divisions and factions going on in the church. Now, one of the scariest things to happen in a church is when the church begins to divide against itself. When a church who should be united in the gospel. Now, I want to say something. Unity does not mean uniformity. Uniformity means that everybody is the same, looks at things the same, likes the same things, wants to do the same. I mean, unity mean, uniformity means everything is the same. But what unity says is that although we have differences over here, the thing that unites us is more important. That we are united around some things. Can I tell you some things that we ought to be united around? We ought to be united around the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. 
It's not up for debate, not up for discussion. The Bible is the Word of God. That, say, we ought to be united around the fact that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Not just the Bible, the Word of God. Jesus, the only way to heaven. He has provided a way, and the only way we get to heaven is through Him. What are we united around the fact that God created us all in His image, and as such, we, uh, life is valuable. Life has meaning and purpose. And so there are things that unite us together. And can I tell you something? If we're united around the Word of God and around the Son of God and around the value of life, doesn't, isn't that more important than some of the, the trivial things that can sometimes divide us? This church had forgotten the value of unity. And factions had begun to show up. Groups over here and groups over here. And they were being torn apart from the inside. Now Paul warned Titus about division. In Titus 3 he says, listen, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. Knowing that such a man is perverted and sinning, being self-condemned. He says, listen, there comes a point where you have to confront folks who are trying to rip the body apart on the inside. Now listen, if there is a doctrinal issue, we got to deal with it. But maybe you've seen churches that were torn apart because one person over here didn't like a person over here. So this person over here got their group together against this person over here, and they got their group together. And before you know it, they're fighting. And the irony is it's like, well, we, we go to Harmony Baptist Church. All right, well, then they have a big fight and fuss, and Harmony Baptist Church stays over here, and these folks over here go over there and form Harmony Number 2 Baptist Church. Have you ever been in a church where, been in a town where there was a second Baptist Church? A lot of times the second Baptist Church came as a split from the first Baptist Church. So you see this warning against division. Again, that doesn't mean that we're the same, but it does mean that we are to strive to maintain the unity of the body in the bond of peace. We're to strive to work together and remain united around the most important thing. Now, the sad thing is, notice what Paul brings out. And it really is heartbreaking. He says in verse 20, Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. You remember, the church was to come together to remember the sacrifice of Christ. And he says, listen, you're, this is to bring you together for good, and yet you were so divided, you're not coming together for good, you're coming together and it's harming. Notice verse 21. For, for you're in your eating, each one takes his own supper at home. One is hungry and another is drunk. You said, now what does that mean? How many of you understand that in a church of any size, you have different levels of socioeconomic statuses? Some folks, you know, the, the, the old joke is, you know, sometimes... At the end of the month, you're just hoping the ends meet, and sometimes they wave. <laughs> They're not, they don't even meet. They're just kind of waving at each other. And then you have folks who are, who are making ends meet, who they don't have a lot extra, but by God's grace, they're making ends meet. Then you have some who have a little extra. And then you'll have some who are very wealthy who really can do anything they want to. And every layer of the socioeconomic status is represented. You think about the church at Corinth. You had folks who were very wealthy. You had folks who were very poor. And they were coming together in the church. And notice the picture. He says, when you come together for the Lord's Supper, some of you are drunk, having overindulged, and others who are hungry, who are in want. He said, this is supposed to be bringing you together, and yet you are abusing and they had forgotten the power and the importance of unity. And notice Paul, I, can't you just hear it in his voice? Uh, he's like, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And this I will not praise you. You see, the church would come together, folks would come, and, and this was even happening. They had two things. They would have the Lord's Supper, and they would have what they would call a love feast. Can I give you the Baptist equivalent of a love feast? A fellowship meal, right? Uh, <laughs> they, 
Uh, you know, you think about the emblems of your faith. I heard this joke one time, and it said, you know, uh, these three people were saying, okay, when you get to heaven, what, are the, what would be the emblems of your denomination? Well, you know, there's all different kinds, and they came back down to the Baptist and said, well, it'd be a casserole dish. Uh, you know, we think about Baptists, we love to fellowship together. And they would have these meals, and it, which would spawn into the Lord, that would lead into the Lord's Supper, but you have folks who'd get there, They'd eat all the food, they'd be full and drunk, and then you have other folks who come who are hungry. He said, this is, this is crazy. You are divided when this should be bringing you together. So they had forgotten the value of unity. Secondly, they forgot the reason for the Lord's Supper in the first place. Look at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. Now, it's interesting. Paul is confronting the worldliness of the church. He's confronting divisions and factions. He's confronting them for being drunk and overindulged. And in the midst of that, it's as if the the fog clears. And he says, let me tell you what I received from the Lord. Now you say, Ron, why is this important? Can I tell you why? Do you know that scholars believe that 1 Corinthians was the first book written in the New Testament? That is, it was even written before the gospel accounts. So this is really the first recounting in writing that we have of the Lord's Supper. Now you say, Ron, does that mean that people didn't know about it? No. In Jewish life, there were kind of two, and and you probably know this, but let me just kind of share with you. You have two kind of bodies of information traveling at the same time. Jewish, the Jews had what they called the oral traditions. That is where they would tell the stories of what happened. And then you have the written word kind of traveling together. And so you see this oral, these oral stories of things that have happened. And then you have the written word. And so obviously the people had heard about the events of Jesus' life. But this is the first written accounting of the Lord's Supper. And so Paul gives us the time stamp, doesn't he? For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. You say, no, so what is this referring to? Well, we know, right? This is the night where Jesus took bread with his disciples, observing the Passover right before. Remember what happens. He takes the Passover. He institutes the Lord's Supper. He goes out from there to Gethsemane. He prays. His sweat becomes as great drops of blood. Judas and the Romans come. He is betrayed, which lead to the events of the crucifixion. So Paul kind of gives us a time stamp. He says, okay, this is when all this transpired. And this is the reason for the Lord's Supper. And you guys have forgotten it. Notice what he says. In the same night in which the Lord Jesus, in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, the In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now notice, Paul says, This is what I have received from the Lord. Now when we think about the Passover meal... Um, we, we see, I don't know if you've ever observed a Passover Seder. Some of you may have been here when we did it back there. And we saw how it unfolds with the Psalms. Uh, there's different cups of wine passed around, bitter herbs. And now Jesus takes the fourth cup. Uh, well, he takes the third cup and he blesses it. And he begins to describe this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now notice what happens. When Jesus had given thanks, he broke it, the bread, and said, "This." notice what he says. Jesus takes the bread, and he says this. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now the bread used to represent the, the children of Israel and their exodus from Egypt. Now Jesus said it, is, it references my body which is for you. Now, uh, some translations say which is broken for you. Now, when we think about that word broken, it doesn't appear in the earliest manuscripts and it doesn't appear in the original language. Uh, It's a picture of what happened to Jesus. But remember, uh, what happened 
Do you remember that what how, how the Romans they would crucify, and then how would they speed up death? You know, crucifixion. They didn't die from blood loss, although the blood loss was severe. The cause of death from crucifixion is asphyxiation. That is, as the body slumps, uh, the, the, the prisoner, the one being executed, would literally be asphyxiated. He would suffocate. He would die. And so what the Romans would do to try to speed up the process, they would come by and they would break the legs of the prisoners. Why? Because then they, they couldn't push up to get any more air. That's what would happen. The prisoner would be faced with a horrific choice. Do I struggle to breathe or do I press against the nails that have been driven through my ankles, inflicting excruciating... Can you imagine having to face that choice? I'm either going to suffocate or press down on a, on a spike through my ankles. And you remember what happens. The Bible records that the soldiers came by to break the legs of the criminals. And what did they find when they came to Jesus? He was already dead. And they pierced his side with the spear and out came water and blood. You remember, uh, the Bible says that not a bone of him shall be broken. That's what John records in John 19. Uh, but that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, so Jesus' this bread represents Jesus' body, which is for you. I'm telling you what, when you think about the words for you, just 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 let that sit for a second. Jesus looking at his disciples, looking down through the portals of time, says to you, the bread that you that you have at the Lord's Supper is my body. For you. I came to earth for you. I lived a sinless life for you. I died in your place for you. I rose from the grave for you. I have ascended and make intercession at the right hand of the Father for you. Do you see why Paul is astounded that they have forgotten this? I mean, they, they've become so selfish and so misguided that they've forgotten the very reason for the Lord's Supper in the first place. And then he begins to describe the cup in his, that represented his blood. His blood was spilled for us. And notice what he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. When you do it. Now, one important thing to note is the frequency isn't prescribed in Scripture. Some do it weekly, some do it monthly, others will do it quarterly. The frequency is not prescribed. However, the frequency isn't the issue. It's the faithfulness to observe it in an appropriate way that's the issue. And that we do it at a regular interval. I love what he says. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Reminds us that Jesus is coming again. Well, I've got to hurry. The last thing they forgot, notice. Verses 27 through 34 give us this picture. The church had forgotten the danger of improperly observing the Lord's Supper. They'd forgotten that there's danger if you celebrate it improperly. They'd forgotten the reason. They'd forgotten the importance of unity. And they had forgotten the danger of improperly observing the Lord's Supper. Notice he begins to warn them. In verse 27, he says, therefore, he's pointing back to this sacrifice, this institution of the Lord's Supper. Therefore, because of this, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. We can come to the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way. That's if we come to it just as, hey, this is just something to check off the list. Or, hey, I'm not really thinking about Jesus. I'm just trying to think of, just trying to get through this so I can go do something else. I, I can come to it in an unworthy way by cherishing sin in my heart. And we become guilty of his body and blood. That is, that we are dishonoring him. And then he warns them. He says, uh, let a man examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Before we take part of the Lord's Supper, we ought to examine ourselves. We want to think about how we're living. Are we doing what God has called us to do? Because if we don't, notice Paul gives us the, the unintended consequence. For we'll eat and drink judgment to ourselves. Judgment there is the idea, it's, it's the idea of chastening or 
punishing or correcting. Now, some um, translations would, um, it says eat, I think it's the King James, it says eat and drink damnation to himself. That's, 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 a, that's an unfortunate translation. Let me tell you why. Romans 8 says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. If you are his, you will never be eternally separated from him. He who began a good work in you will perform it. And so the, the idea of damnation, it gives the picture that you'll be eternally separated from God. That's not the point. But he says you will be temporally judged. You will suffer chastisement from the Father. Now let me ask you this. How many of y'all ever had to get on to your kids and punish your kids? Everybody, right? But that didn't separate you, that them in relationship to you. That did not cut off your relationship with them, although you did chastise them. That's the picture of judgment. Now notice he begins to describe how the church was being punished. Some were weak, some were sick, and a number sleep. It's a euphemism for death. He said, God has even killed some of you because you didn't do it rightly. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord in order that we might not be condemned with the world. That word condemned does speak of eternal consequences. So you see the contrast? He said on one side, Christians are being disciplined by the Lord. The world is being judged because they have not received Christ. That's the contrast. And so, again, further supporting the point that, listen, it's not speaking of eternal damnation to the Christian. It's just chastisement and punishment in the present. Okay. Notice Paul closes out the chapter. If anyone is hung, so then my, verse 33, so then my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. That is, show common courtesy. Wait, don't barge ahead just because you have the ability to, just because you're there. Don't neglect your brother. Wait for one another. And if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. I mean, don't come and just think that the Lord's Supper is a time just to pig out. You eat everything, and then, the, then others are neglected. He said, if you're hungry, eat before you come. And then he says this, so that you won't come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Now, I'm going to close with this. It's interesting. Paul says, there's other stuff going on. I'm going to deal with that when I get there. Now, how many of y'all, when you talk to your parents, if you ever did this, if you ever talked to them, and they said, hey, when you get home... Uh, we got to deal with this. You did not want to go home. Can I get a witness? Uh, I remember being at times when I'd be at church as a little boy, and I'd have kind of acted up. And Grandma said, we're going to deal with this when we get home. I'm like, I don't want to go home, Grandma. Because why? I knew when Grandma got me home, I was going to have to be dealt with. And Paul said, listen, there's other stuff going on, but I'm going to deal with that when I come. You see, the church had forgotten the importance of unity. They had forgotten the reason for the Lord's Supper, and they, were, they had forgotten the danger of improperly observing it. And so let me ask you just this in closing. Is it possible for us to forget these things? Is it possible for us to forget about what really unites us and allow that to allow what unites us to help us fight against division? We ought to do that. Is it possible that we forget the real reason for the Lord's Supper? Sure. Let's not do that. And when it comes time here shortly to observe the Lord's Supper, let's not take it improperly. Let's do it the right way. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. Um, Lord, help us. Those of us who are we're, we're very easy to forget things. Help us not to forget the value, the importance of unity. God, help us not to forget why the Lord's Supper was instituted. And help us not to forget the importance of being faithful to take it in a worthy manner. Jesus, I love you. I praise you. Go with us now in your, in your precious name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. You're dismissed.